the God of the mountain. He is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. working for our good. 
He is always working for our God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are good, God. The Holy Spirit wants to do a, a great work in this place. And I suggest that we just all cooperate with Him. Amen? The Bible says we should seek and desire the gifts of the Spirit. Right? We do. Amen? But we should also seek and desire to live and walk in the fruit of the Spirit. So not only do we want to see the gifts, yes, we want to see the gifts, but we also should see ourselves changing in the fruits of the Spirit. Do I have more love today than I had yesterday? Do I have more peace, joy? Do I have more patience today than I did yesterday? Goodness, gentleness, self-control, kindness, all of those things. And so as we sing this song, and it is an old song, so young people, don't shut down. The words of this are good. There are only 13 words out of the English language used in this song, but they are powerful words. And so even though it's an old song, it's something that is fresh for today. And if you'll sing these songs with sincerity, the Holy Spirit will do amazing things in you. Amen. guidance and your wisdom, your forgiveness, your healing, 
And all of that comes along with me. Knowing you and having a relationship with you. But I just need you. I'm so desperate for you. This really is what I say to him pretty much on a daily basis. Because I cannot do the things he wants me to do without him. And I cannot live the life that he died to give me without him. We've got to be more desperate for our Lord.
to him. If you don't know Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Run to him today and let him totally change your life. If you do know Jesus, run to him now, just face to face with God, spending time in his word and time in prayer and trusting in him. He wants to do amazing things in you, for you, but mainly in you and then through you. The more we surrender to him so that he can do what he needs to do in here, the more we are going to be effective for his destiny for us, his purpose for us. And I love you all, and I want you to have God's very best for you. So I encourage you to run to the Father, run to the Father, run to the Father. Lord, I love you. Let's just love on him a little bit more. Lord, you are good. You are good. You are good. You are worthy, God. I thank you that we can run to you every time we need you, that we can run to you a million times a day, and you are there for us with arms open wide. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll have your way. Have your way, have your way in all of us. Have your way in me. I want to glorify you, God. I want to glorify you. I praise you and I thank you, Holy Spirit, and I just pray that you will touch every person who's watching on live stream, every person who's in here. Make us more like you today, God. You are beautiful and awesome. Thank you for showing up. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being everything that we need. I love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen, amen. We love you, Lord. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Great time of praise and worship, wasn't it? My husband and I went yesterday to watch our grandchildren play basketball and they were amazing they were just all stars ready for you signed up by any college in my eyes but you know as I was watching them and I was thinking about our father the Lord just spoke this to me he said you know when they would dribble and they would drop the ball we didn't say oh pick that ball up don't you know what you're doing we'd say good try good job try again and I thought, you know, Lord, that's just the way you are with us. When we are in this game of life and we stumble and we fall or we don't do it exactly right, you don't stand up there and go, what are you doing? You can't play this game. He says, pick it up. Good job. Try again. And that's what it's all about, getting up, trying again, doing it over. Because God's our Father, and he's a good, good Father, and he loves us. And he wants us to succeed just as much as we want all of our children and grandchildren to succeed. And that's such a beautiful picture. And I know sometimes we forget that our Father's cheering us on, not waiting for us to miss up, but to cheer us on. Isn't that awesome? It's great. Well, here's another opportunity for us to praise and worship Him through our tithes and our offerings. There's lots of ways that you can give. You can give today in the service. You can give out in the sanctuary at our kiosk. You can give online on our website. You can give at our app. If you don't have the app, please go to your app store, your Play Store. Search for PCA.com, download the app, answer affirmatively, and you will have a way to give. Not only a way to give, but you'll also be able to keep up with everything that's going on. And speaking of, next Sunday, our youth is going to have a silent auction, dessert auction out in the foyer. So all of you great bakers and cookers and chefs, if you can donate something yummy, please do bring it up here and donate it, and we will have it out in the foyer, and it's all the proceeds go to our youth ministry. Our youth ministry needs our help, right? They are poor. They do not have a lot of money. They need your help. All right, gentlemen, if you will come. If you are a guest with us today, we hope that you feel welcome. There's a card in front of you that says VIP. If you are a first-time guest, please fill that out. 
and turn it in the offering basket, and you will have lots of people praying for you. If you put a uh, prayer, prayer request on there, we have God-fearing, faith-filled people that will pray over that. All right, Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house on your day. I know, Father, it's Super Bowl day, and there's lots of people so excited about that, but how much more should we be excited to be in your house to worship you and to hear what you have to say for us? Father, I pray that you would bless this offering. Those that are giving, Father, give back to them, pressed down, shaken together, running over. And Lord, I pray a special off prayer over our pastor, Lord, that you would give him a double portion of your anointing, Father, that he would touch every heart, mind, and soul that you have in his presence and in the sound of his voice to reach what you have for them in their lives. We so very careful to give you all the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, 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 you made it through the ice and the snow today to be at church. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's nice and warm in here. Today I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if everybody in the auditorium had their own recliner? I think this might be something you might want to talk to your board about is purchasing a lot of recliners and just putting them throughout cup holders, massage, heat, all those things. But some of you are going, I don't need that to sleep, Pastor. I'm already sleeping pretty good in these chairs. But uh, just think. Man, if you prop those feet up, how nice it would be. Now, today is Super Bowl Sunday, and there's a lot going on. Man, there's a lot of people going to have their, they're so excited their team wins, and then they're so down because their team lost. I've got some conspiracy theories, but I've told everybody before church, and so I'm going to see if it happens today or not, because I think something might be going on. Now, see, I got your attention when I said something like that. No, no, nothing's going on. But I do believe that, that it, being in the house of God is the greatest thing we can do. Amen? Being in the house of God. So today, I, you know, in the years past, I've done all kinds of Super Bowl messages, and we've had football targets and all this stuff going around. I thought today, um, I just could not get an approval to do all that from God. So today, God said, don't mess up my series that I'm doing right now. I said, okay. He said, Super Bowl's not going to interrupt it. And so today I'm going to continue on this theme of anointing. Amen. Stand with me today and get your Bibles, lift them up with me, because man, I am ready to give you some good bread and drink of water today. Repeat this after me. Thy word, Thy word. is a lamp unto my feet. Thy word is a light unto my path. Thy word will I hide in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Lord, help me. Every day to read thy word. Lord, help me every day to live thy word. I love thy word. Amen. Thank you, Father. You may be seated. But it is Super Bowl Sunday, and there's going to be a lot of people who are betting, and a lot of people who are winning, and a lot of people who are losing. But I'm glad that with God, we're always winners, aren't you? And we're always on the offense, we never have to play defense. God says you're to be on the offense all the time, conquering hell, storming the gates of hell, more than conquerors. We can tear down every stronghold. There's not a defense that can handle a man or a woman of God. There's not enough demons in hell to stop us from scoring from God. No way any of that's going to happen. And so today, I want you to have that vision because I want to talk about anointing. I've had so many people make so many observations, and it lets me know that there's a lot of teaching in our world today about anointing, and a lot of it gets clouded and confused. And so today I want to talk about it again. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 1. 2 Chronicles 5, 1. When all the work Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished. I'm sure Solomon was so glad it is finished. He brought in the things his father David had dedicated, the silver and gold and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of God's temple. Second Chronicles chapter 6, starting at verse 40 and following. Now, my God, may your eyes be open and your ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. Isn't that our prayer today? God, be attentive. May your eyes and ears be ready to see and hear. Now arise, Lord God, and come to your resting place. You and the ark of your might. We have now prepared a place that is more permanent. Instead of just walking around with the ark and tent to tent to tent, now there's a tabernacle, a temple of God. May your priest, Lord God, be clothed with salvation. May your faithful people rejoice in your goodness. Lord God, do not reject your anointed one. 
Remember the great love promised to David, your servant. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven, consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the Israelites saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, He is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. Wouldn't that be an awesome Sunday here at PCA Church? I mean, we get up, we have praise and worship, and God's presence I mean, we literally see fire come down from heaven, and it consumes us, and we're on fire for God, and God's presence is so strong that I couldn't even preach because all of us are just on our faces on the ground before God, and we're all worshiping. He is good, and His mercy endures. How many of you would like to have a Sunday like that at PCA Church? If you want that kind of Sunday, just give God a big hand clap praise. Come on. Yes. The fire falls two times in the Old Testament, and it falls one time in the New Testament. Fire of God is symbolic of the power and the anointing of God, just like wind is, just like water, and just like oil. I've been talking about the oil-based anointing that was on the priest, but now the temple has been finished that Solomon built, and now they're dedicating it, and the power and the anointing of God falls in that place. I wonder what people will say when we get to heaven. They go, oh, you should have been there. Pastor, it was awesome. I've seen God's presence many times in the church, and it is powerful because people don't want to leave. People are just melting in his presence. You know, I've also heard people go, well, when I see God, I'm going to walk right up to him. I'm like, I don't think I am. When I see God, I think I'm going to have to fall on my face before him. Cast my crown at his feet and sing hallelujah with everybody else because of the awesome, awesome glory and power of God. You see, in this text that we're looking at, the fire is limited. It comes down, consumes the sacrifice. But the glory and the anointing of God is never limited. It has no limit because it fills the temple and obviously went out into the, the places where they were because they bowed with their faces onto the pavement. Now that's worship, isn't it? Now that only God can do that. Only God can make people put their faces down into the pavement. I've often wondered, do we really want God to manifest himself? This is a manifestation of God on earth. Do we want God to manifest himself in our lives? Do we really want God to manifest himself in our church? Yeah. That's a serious question. You may go, Pastor, of course we do. A absolutely. Everybody's amen. I don't know. Because in the New Testament, the fire fell in the temple of man, not Solomon's temple. On the day of Pentecost, remember that? Acts chapter 2. And they, it came down with like fire falling like tongues on every one of them, and the sound of the rushing wind. It filled their temples. And, and I tell you what, the manifestation of God is a powerful thing, and it does make us aware of all of our senses. We talked about that. We can hear it, see it, feel it. But the power and the anointing of God is for so much more than that because after that manifestation of God in their lives, He didn't just manifest Himself for their feelings, but he manifested himself for them to be brought into action, for them to proclaim the good news wow. to everybody. 2 Chronicles 5.11 The priest then withdrew from the holy place. All the priests who were there had consecrated themselves regardless of their divisions. It didn't matter which Sunday they were supposed to serve in the temple. It didn't matter what division they were assigned to. It said the priests all consecrated themselves. Deuteronomy 18, 18. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites. 
I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command. That is a foretelling of Jesus Christ to come. Zechariah 9.9 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous, victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Again, foretelling of who? The anointed one coming to us. Isaiah 59, 20. The Redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. This is prophecies of Jesus Christ coming. Now let's take it to the New Testament. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 18 and 19. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. You see, today the anointing is not just for us to feel good. It's a call to action. The first thing we have to do is consecrate ourselves, and then we have to have God empower us with that powerful anointing. But then we have this action of the ministry of reconciliation. Every one of us are now priests and part of the priesthood. And we are to consecrate ourselves regardless of any divisions. Consecrate ourselves to God. And then we are to go out, tell the good news, to reconcile the world back to to God. It has often been said that without God, you cannot, but without you, God will not. You see, God puts all this on our shoulders. You came into my life, I came into your life, you consecrated yourself. In the New Testament, it says this purify yourselves. That's your job. Sanctify yourself. The priest had to consecrate themselves. If we want a manifestation of God in our lives, a manifestation of God in our church, the first thing that we have to do as priests, and part of the priesthood, is we have to consecrate ourselves. We have to purify, sanctify ourselves. What that means is this, get right with God. That's what it means. When they consecrated themselves, they got everything right in the eyes of God. And God did not count their sins against them. Isn't that amazing? Today, if we're part of the priest and the priesthood, and we are now the anointed ones because Christ came, Chrisma, the anointed one, and gave his anointing, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and it dwells in me, then we have a pattern set forth that God has given to us if we want to see the manifest power of God in our lives in the church. The first thing we have to do, we have to get everything right with God. I know that's not going to be a popular message today, but it is a process. God always lays out the process. If you want manifest presence, consecrate yourselves. We're going to go through some other things. If we want a move of God in our finances, we got to get it lined up. You got to make sure you're tithing, make sure you're doing these things. If you want to have God manifest yourself in healing, all those things, you've got to have faith to believe that the impossible is possible with God. You see, everything that God does is dependent on us. Solomon, he finished the temple. He didn't halfway do it. He finished it. It is done. And then he had a big day to celebrate it. And on that day, they did a lot. We all want the power and the manifestation of the anointing, but sometimes, church, we don't want to do what we have to do to get there. We want to go from here to here and skip over all this stuff. Today, I want to talk about that. You're part of the priesthood. Every one of you are priests. We don't wait once a year for one priest to go into the presence of God. Every one of us. Hebrews says, every one of us, when we choose to, we can boldly walk into the throne room of God and lay our petitions at His feet. Wow, what a transformation from the Old Testament. And at the same time, he says, now I want you to consecrate yourselves. I want you to get things right with me. I've had people tell me, I'm a plumber. No, you're not a plumber. You're a priest, and you're a plumber to support your ministry. Well, I'm an engineer. No, you're not an engineer. You're part of the priesthood. 
You just do things in the engineering field to support you being a minister. Every one of us have the ministry of reconciliation. You are chosen by God. Revelation 1, 5 through 6. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be kingdom and priest, to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Wow. That's us. That's you and me. We get to come in and serve God. I want you to get that. We get to come in and serve God. Serve God. In my ministry, I have seen a lot of high-maintenance Christians and also some Christians with some very low impact. I believe God wants all of us to have a life that is impactful. Not high-maintenance, I think God wants us all to grow up and be mature and self-sustaining. We walk into the presence of God, walk into the house of God, and we don't need somebody to feed us. We come in and we're ready to eat ourselves. Somebody said one time, I don't like change. Well, nobody likes change. The only person I found out that likes change is a wet baby. They're the only ones that want change. Everybody else is like, leave it alone. But if we want to get right with God, and we want a manifestation of God in our lives, we want God's power and glory to come down out of heaven, onto us, onto this church, into this community, we've got to follow the process God has set forth. We've got to make everything right. I want to reminisce a little bit today because I found when I was growing up, people who made a decision for Christ, who repented of their sins, I found one common denominator. They wept, they cried tears of repentance. And I'm finding today that if we're not careful, we can have what I call a dry-eyed salvation. We're not having a conversion, we're simply making a decision. I think we need conversions, don't you? We need to be converted from death to life. We need to be converted from old to new. We need to be converted from light to darkness, all those things. We've got to have a conversion, not just a decision. We've got to be the one who decides, and, and now I want a conversion of my life. I remember preachers preaching on hell a lot. And they could preach it really, really well. I remember going to so many services and they preach on hell. And what really would get me every time, I don't know if any of you have ever been there, but they would start counting backwards from 10. Anybody ever been in those services? They'd say, there, there's some people who need to know Jesus Christ tonight, and, and God's told me that you got the count of 10, and if you don't, you walk out that door, get hit by a bus, get hit by a train. There was always a horrible accident. You walk out of there, you die, you're going to hell. And they start counting backwards, 10. All right, there's some of you like, did you say something? Nine. And I would hold on, eight. I'd get to about six, and then I'm running to the altar every time. God, I don't want to walk out and a bus hit me, a train hit me, have, a, have an accident, die. I don't want to do that. And I thought, you know what? I would rather for us to have sometimes a little bit of fear of hell than no fear at all. We need to understand there's a real hell and it's filled with people who did not accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That was not their destiny by God, but it was their destiny by choice. God has created a heaven for everyone who will finally bow their knee, bow their will to become part of the priesthood. But if you don't do that, I'm telling you, there is a hell. I love grace, but grace ends when you take your last breath, then you meet the judge who is God Almighty. And it's judgment time. It's not about grace and mercy. It's about judgment. And hell is real because heaven is real. And God is real. And I believe sometimes we live as though it's not really real, Pastor. And when I get there, listen, I'm a smooth talker. I've got a lot of charisma. I believe I'm going to be able to make my case before God. He's going to go, man, you, you really, oh, come on in. God's not going to do that. If your life has not been 
into the blood of Jesus Christ and all your sins have been removed from your life. You will not enter. We've got to understand the reality of hell, the reality of death. I want to ask you again, do you really want the anointing? Do you really want the manifestation of God in your life and in this church? Then I believe every one of us need to get things right with God. Every one of us. We need to repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I don't believe anybody in this place is without sin. I believe even after salvation, I haven't committed a sin since salvation. Well, maybe have you repented for uh, dead works? Because if you have faith but you don't have works, come on. Have you repented of unconfessed sins? Have you repented for the sins of omission? I find all kinds of things in my life. I need to go into the presence of God. I need to consecrate myself first. Repent of my sins first. Get everything right with God. So then I allow God the ability to put the anointing upon my life. To give me that manifest presence of God. It is awesome. Look at this, 2 Chronicles 5, 12 through 14. All the Levites who were musicians, there's 12 groups. One of these groups is the Levites, and they lead the praise and worship. Isn't it awesome? And God says all the Levites have to be able to sing, have to be able to play instruments. And so they were musicians, Asaph, Heman, Jeduthun, and their sons and relatives. They stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linens, playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. Wouldn't that be awesome? 120 trumpets. The trumpeters and the musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, other instruments, the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good, His mercy and lures forever. Isn't that awesome? I think God loves praise and worship, don't you? Then the temple of the Lord was filled with a cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of God. I believe God inhabits the picture in the Old Testament and New, that when we praise God, His presence descends as a throne, and God sits upon that throne in our presence. God inhabits the praises of His people. So I believe when we get a unison heart, we begin to let the musicians and the singers sing, and we begin to join in that praise in unison, and with one heart and one mind in one place, all of a sudden the praise goes up, and they used to say the glory comes down. Why? Because God is in that formula of praise. Yeah. All of them were consecrated. All of them participated. I'm going to get into our... Little back pockets this morning. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will enter his courts with praise. And everybody participated. So there's not only this process of getting everything prepared, like they did with Solomon, the Levites, the priests. I believe they had practices. I believe they all said, let's all play in the same key. Let's all sing. Let's do harmonies. Cymbals, don't play here. Cymbals, play here. I mean, let's get this dynamic. Let's get this crescendo building. And when they got there, boom, it all went up to God, and the glory of God filled that place. Wow. They were prepared. They began to praise, and God's glory filled that house. Everybody prepared. Everybody participated. They anointed everything in that place. The lamps never ran out of oil. Don't you love that? I said this in a leadership meeting a few weeks ago, but I don't believe anything, anybody ever gets burned out as long as they're on fire. I don't believe in getting burned out. Because in the temple there were lamps and the priest had to make sure uh, that the lamps never ran out of oil. So they were constantly, 24 hours a day, making sure the, the wicks were trimmed and they were filled with oil, 24-7, 365. I believe that's a picture of what God wants us to be today, don't you, church? To have a life that is, that is on the level, that is always full, we're always burning bright, the wick is always trimmed, and we bring light everywhere we go. There's no time off, there's no burnout, there's no, I mean, we are on fire for God. They got everything ready. Then they all participated. They sacrificed the animals for the sins of the people. Now think about this. You've got all these people living in a confined area and these priests are sacrificing. You see, the priests, when they came to church, 
It wasn't like, bless me, Lord. They realized this is going to be a tough day. We've got to do sacrifices for the entire nation of Israel. There's going to be lots of bulls, lots of goats, lots of pigeons, lots of everything. So the priests were coming in, and guess what? They were ready. They consecrated themselves. They had the oil of anointing upon them to help cover the stench of the sins of people. But they began. Have any of you ever slaughtered an animal? Just one? I have. It's not a pretty sight. Not a pretty sight. I mean, I, I, I feel bad. But th those, those animals, are they're making their last sounds. And within seconds... I mean, that animal is not alone or alive, but it's down on the ground and blood is gushing out of its throat. And the priests are there and they're, they're trying to get this animal, uh, get it all cleaned out and get ready to cut it up and carve it up to get it ready for the altar. And so these priests are over here bringing animals in. These priests are here killing them and, and moving them over to the next ones. They're cutting them up and the others are putting them on the altar. It's a lot of hard work. And the stench and the smell that was going on for the sins of the people Today, we walk into the house of God and we don't want to do anything. Come on. We don't want to work. Well, Pastor, we stand up too long. You stand up too long for God? Now, I understand my back hurts, my knees hurt, everything. Listen, sit down, but don't let your spirit sit down. We need to walk into the house of God as priests and realize I am not here for God to bless me. I am here as a priest of God to bless God with my praise, with my offerings, with my giftings, with my voice. The body is to be offered up as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God as a form of worship. We come in here with the ideology in America that we need to have somebody sing something to bless me. No, 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 no. We come in today with our ideologies. We want somebody to say something to bless me, make me feel good. No, we walk into the house and say, God, what work do you want me to do today? What do you want me to do to serve you? I'm going to give you all I've got. I'm going to bless the Lord with everything that is within me, all my strength, my body, my mind, my soul. I'm sacrificing it for you because of your glory, your manifest power. God, fill my temple again today. I need the oil. I need to burn bright. I need you to trim that wick in my life. Take some things away. I lay it on the altar of sacrifice. It's not a pretty place, but God over there is the sacrifice sacrifice that's being consumed and it's a beautiful thing in the sight of God come on church we've got to get ready to work when we come into the presence of God we're not coming in to bless me we're coming in to say God I bless you and I don't know how we've gotten it turned around in our churches in America we've got to understand that sometimes praise and worship it's work have you ever had to work through praise and worship I have I mean, sometimes you're just not feeling it. Sometimes it's just not, whew, it's tough. I got to tell you, sometimes when I preach, maybe I shouldn't tell you this, but sometimes when I preach it's tough and then sometimes it's really easy. I find sometimes God wants us to work through to get to his anointing. We've got to work to get there. You've got to consecrate yourself. You can't be sitting there going, well, I have no sins in my life. Why, do I, why would I go to the altar? I said it a few weeks ago. People who really need Jesus will find a way to get to him. Sometimes I think we look at our lives and go, I don't really need Jesus. I need him. I need his manifest power in my life. Sometimes we have to stand a little longer. We have to clap our hands a little longer. I've left church before. My hands were literally sore from clapping. Yeah. Because it just was the anointing in the house. We need to be here, yes, to be uncomfortable sometimes. To work at it at times. We've got to enter with thanksgiving. We've got to proclaim. We cannot be silent. On the day of Pentecost, and we all want that experience too, don't we? 
On the day of Pentecost, the disciples were gathered in an upper room, and the glory of God filled that place. He manifested his presence with fire, and then he got beyond their feelings, and they went out into the streets. And what did they do? They proclaimed the good news of God. As priests, they were different because they had a conversion. They just weren't there at 9 o'clock in the morning and go, guys, we've been in this room too long. Let's just make a decision to go out into the streets. No, no, God empowered them to walk out into their world. And the Bible says they turned it upside down. And so we look at the Bible, we look at this, and, and man, we want the manifestation power of God. I mean, look what happened. Acts chapter 1, God tells them to wait. They wait. Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the glory and power of God and the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Amen? We believe in that today, don't we? The Holy Spirit is still baptizing people in the anointing. We find that in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 3 is an awesome chapter. If you look at all these chapters, verse 1 is awesome. And so uh, they were going into the temple, and every day all these people passed this lame man. But that day, two of these disciples who had been empowered with the manifest glory and anointing of God, they walked by him, and he cried out like he did every other day, alms, 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 help me out. You got a little sign, uh, need help. And this time the two disciples stopped. And I love what they said. Look at me. There's a lot of different ways he could have looked at them, but he may have looked, they may have been saying, look at us, look how we're dressed. Do you think we have any money? I mean, look at us. You're asking us for money? You should ask the guy in the gold robe just before us. He says, look at us. I think it could have been their clothing, but I think also there's something different about their eyes. Filled with compassion. Look at us. He says, money, we don't have that. Silver and gold don't have it. But such as what we do have, we're about to give it to you. I love that. And the Bible says that he reached down his hand, helped the guy get up. That's faith, right? That's knowing that you know that you know. They reached down, grabbed him by the hand, this lame man who had been sitting there every day begging. He jumps up and he looks at it. He's standing up by himself. And the Bible says he starts running and leaping and praising God. He even goes into the temple, shows himself to everybody, and they're going, wow, you're the guy that, I can't even recognize you. Vertical, I'm so loose to seeing you. Horizontal, I didn't know you were that tall. And all the, he's like, look what God has done in my life. What an awesome, awesome time. Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4 is also, because now they get the disciples, they come in, and they ask them this question. I love this question. By what power and what name are you doing these miracles? By what power and what name? They said the name is Jesus Christ whom you crucified. And the power is the anointing of the Holy Spirit that now dwells inside of us. Yeah, Acts 1, Acts 2, Acts 3, Acts 4, Acts 6. Yeah, Acts chapter 6, we find that they are talking about getting the disciples, deacons, so they can help, serve. So Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Oh, wait a minute. I left out chapter 5. Let's go back to chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. There's a couple sold a piece of land. And they got a good, good sale on it. And the husband walks into church first. Because this is the way church has always been, right? We can walk in there. And we can pull the wool over their eyes. So he walks in. His name is Ananias. And, and they ask him. He's going, hey, pastor, I got a big offering today. It's got some zeros on the end of it before the decibels. Look at me, look at me. And so they ask him, is this the full tithe on what you sold the property for? Now, see, the night before, he and his lovely wife, Sapphire, probably been getting together and go, man, that's a lot of money. We, had a, we got a really good price for that property. And she starts thinking, well, maybe we, I need a new fur. You know, the lady's been looking at my coat a little late. It's kind of tattered and worn. And he's probably going, you know what? It'd be nice if we had a new boat and, we, and pay off these things. And it, I've also wanted to, not only a boat, but I think it'd be nice to have a little getaway cabin up in the mountains sometimes, you know, because it gets so hot down here during the summer. And so they walk in and, the, and they bring in something less than the tithe. And up until now, they've been able to get away with that. 
but not this Sunday morning because there's a power in the house. And so they ask him, is this it? And he says, absolutely. And he lies to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit strikes him dead. And the Bible says some men come and get him out. And just barely by the time they got him out, his wife comes in and says, hey, pastor, I got an offering. They bring her up and they said, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. This is the full price. Lies to the Holy Spirit, she's struck dead again. Boom. Take her out. Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. Manifestations of the power of God. But also Acts 5 is a manifestation of the power of God. Amen. Now I need to ask you the question again. Do we really want a manifestation of the power of God in this house? Because it'll mean we can no longer lie to the Holy Spirit. It'll mean we can no longer mail it in. It'll mean we can no longer just halfway do anything. We've got to bring what we are supposed to bring, our bodies, our lives, our everything, and present it to God as a living sacrifice. And the Holy Spirit will ask you, is that the full amount with your praise? Yes, sir. Is that the full amount with your offering? Yes, sir. Is that the full amount for your dedication? Yes, sir. Then I will now pour my manifestation anointing upon your life because you got things right. You see, we want Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 and following. But why did God put Acts 5 so close to the front? Because he wants us to understand, don't lie to me. You can lie to your spouse. I remember as a little kid, an evangelist come in and he, he said stuff like this. God talks to me more by accident than he does to you on purpose. And this guy had a gift. Ooh, he was the real deal. You know, I've seen a lot of phonies in my life, but this guy was a real deal. And man, he'd preach and that was wonderful. But when it got to after his preaching, he would start walking around and just telling people the truth. The truth. It was real. We had a dear, sweet lady in the church and she comes down and he goes to pray for her and he goes, uh, Grandma, he whispers in her ear, kind of like really quiet, Grandma, you need to stop dipping that snuff. She says, I'll have you know I don't dip snuff. He said, no, Grandma, come on. You need to stop dipping that snuff. She goes, I, I don't dip stuff. I, I, I don't use tobacco whatsoever. He said, well, is it, is it okay if I come into your house after church? Yes, come on over. I, I'm, one of the, I'm one of the founding people in this church. Absolutely, come on over. He said, well, okay, Grandma, when I come over, I'm going to go under your pantry on the second shelf under the fourth washcloth. What am I going to find? She melted. Tears running down her cheeks. She said, nobody's known for 40 years I dipped snuff. Not even my husband. He said, Grandma, you got to stop taking that bottom plate out of your teeth and putting that snuff in that false teeth and putting it back in. You need to stop doing that. That's a manifestation of the power of God. What if we come in one Sunday morning and all of a sudden God has given the pastor that gift? And I just walk around and start telling everybody. I think that would shake a few of us up, wouldn't it? You see, with the manifestation of the power of God, we want the glory to fill the house. We want the fire to fall, but we also have to understand there's another entire side to the anointing and the manifestations of God. We've got to get our lives right with God in every area of our life. We can't lie in any part of our life to the Holy Spirit. We're not about men and women. It's about God. God sees everything. He knows everything. And yes, he has grace and yes, he has mercy. But you are now called to be a priest. You are now part of the priesthood. You are now, you are the anointed ones of God. And everything the oil touched was made holy. But we've got to get consecrated before the fire will fall and consume us. The Bible says that God is a consuming fire. God doesn't want parts of our lives. He wants all of our lives. 
Remember that Sunday morning, the lady comes up, they're doing another offering. There's a lot of that in the New Testament. There's an offering, and all these guys, these big pocketed guys are coming around, and man, they're filling the plate up, and this little old lady comes around and gives one little bitty offering. And they stopped the service and said, she's giving more than you all. And all the guys were like, how much did she give? Because I had seven zeros on mine this morning. And they stopped and said, she gave everything. She has nothing left when she walks out of here. Not one little minor to her name. Now, do you have any minors in your bank account when you leave? How much do you have left when you leave? She has given everything. You see, God is all about everything. He's all about all. He's an all-consuming God. Everything that we do is to be praise and glory to God. Everything. We do all things to the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I believe in our church, I want the manifestations of the power of God. I want the gifts and I want the fruit and I want all those things. But in order to do that, church, every one of us, pastor, down, deacons, everybody, no one has an exception. We've all got to get on our face in the pavement. We've all got to get on our knees and say, God, is there anything in my life? Is there something that I should have done that I didn't do? Are there works I should have done that I didn't? Are there things in my life that are not pleasing to you? Father, if there are, please forgive me and wash me and cleanse me. Purify me white as snow so that I may be a vessel that's clean and ready to be used by you. Everybody has to do that. I have to do it before I preach this. That's why I was kind of hoping I preached the Super Bowl message today. And God goes, no, no, no. I'm preparing the church for something. I love it when my wife makes me a cobbler, and she made me one last Saturday. It was awesome. She made it because I told her she'd been making too many cobblers for other people and none for me. And she made it. And I love it when it comes out of the oven hot, and I get it out, put it in a bowl, and put vanilla ice cream on it. I love that. That's awesome. I want that. But I don't want the two hours that goes on before that. To where she has to go to the store, get all the ingredients, come home, and get all the stuff out, make a mess, preparing all this stuff. It's hard work. I just want the dessert at the end. You see, sometimes we come to church and we just want a hot steaming dessert. And we don't think about all the hours it takes over here for pastor to prepare it. We don't think about all the mess I have to go through sometimes to get us to over here. I believe, church, God wants to pour out his anointing in this house greater than ever before. I believe that. Our nation needs churches to have the manifest power of God in them so that when people walk in, they go, whoa, whoa, what is that I feel? What is that I feel? And they walk in, and there's nobody condemning because condemnation is from the enemy, but there is a power of conviction that says, I've got to get things right. I can no longer just do what I want to do and live like I want to live. I've got to get things right with God. Because when I get things right with God, then God begins to pour out his anointing in my life. The anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you want his presence greater in your life, consecrate, prepare, participate, proclaim. Do not lie to God. As a parent, I told my kids two things don't do. Don't lie to me and don't be lazy. And I got to tell you, God's very serious when he says don't lie. Don't lie to the Holy Spirit. Don't try to pull the wool over God's eyes. He sees you and he sees me right now, everything inside of us. I'm not going to count backwards from 10 or anything like that. But I am going to ask you to stand with me this morning. See, up until this point, the presence of God was in the Ark of the Covenant. The priests were never to touch the Ark. The Ark had mountings on the side of it. There was a pole that went through either side, and the priests could touch the pole. They'd take the Ark, put it up on their shoulders, and they're about four on each side, and they would walk with the presence of God every day. Isn't that awesome? Through the wilderness, presence of God. One day, they stumbled. 
And a young man with good intention, he reached out and touched the Ark of the Covenant so it would not fall on the ground. And he was struck dead. Why? Because he touched something he was not supposed to touch. He was not consecrated. He was not a priest. And the priest couldn't even do it. You see, God's presence is something that is to be on our shoulders every day. We're priests. We are to carry around the presence of God in everywhere we go. The Bible even says in the New, New, the New Testament, touch not mine anointed. Yeah. That's not just for pastors. That's for anybody who's a child of God who's part of the priesthood. We need to be ready to be priests to carry the presence of God around in our temples today. People need you with the presence of God to walk into their life. They need your lamp trimmed and burning bright, filled with oil, running over. You see, the fire is limited, but the glory and the power and the presence of God is never limited. It's only limited by how much capacity I let in. It's only limited by how many places in my life I allow God to pour in. And so this morning, I was asking God, Lord, how do you want me to wrap this up today? He said, I'll take care of that for you, Pastor. I said, yes, sir. So all I'm going to do is just allow God to talk to you for just a minute. I don't want anybody leaving. I don't want anybody walking around. I don't want anybody distracting. I usually am not that adamant about that, but today I am. Please, please do not be a distraction to anybody. Can we just for a few moments just stand here? And can we look to God, the author and the finish of our faith, and ask him, God, is there anything in my life I want to get my life consecrated? Lord, is there anything in my life that you need to talk to me about today? It may be an attitude, it may be a deed, it may be not a deed, but a lack of a deed. It may be something at your job, it may be something in your marriage, it may be something with your kids, it may be something in your finances, I don't know. But God knows, he knows everything about you. This morning, I want to give God just a moment. They're going to sing a chorus. I don't want you singing. I just want you to stand there for just a minute. If you've gotten the attitude that I come to church so that God will bless me, we've gotten the wrong attitude. We've got to come in here and bless Him. So, Father, today, I want to have time for you to do what you need to do in every life. And I ask you right now, let your Holy Spirit descend into our hearts. Sing this song. Let us spend a moment in the presence of God right now. Hallelujah. Father God, you see every heart. You know every thought. You know every deed. Lord, I want Acts 1, 2, 3, 5. Hallelujah. Lord, I want that anointing in my life greater than ever before. I want the anointing to pray for the sick and they recover. I want the anointing so that I can have the ministry of reconciling people to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, right now, shine your light into every corner, every recess of our hearts today. Hallelujah. God, today, look. Touch us by your power, by your light. Can we just lift our hands for just a minute? Just lift your hands to Him right now. Just begin to say, God, I love you. I worship you today. Hallelujah. Come on. Oh, hallelujah. Every part. Every part. Let the power of the Holy Ghost fall. Us now, hallelujah. Anointing, anointing, let it fall. Anointing, let it fall. Hallelujah, let the power of the Holy Ghost let it fall.
God, I believe today you are starting a process in my heart, a process in this church. That God, that we come into your presence first and foremost and we say, God, forgive me. God, change me. I don't want to resist change today. I want you to change me, transform me. I want a conversion in my life today. God, if there's anything in my heart that's unpleasing, God, forgive me. I want you to tell me everything that I'm doing wrong so I can do it right. And God, if I walk in with an attitude that I'm doing everything right, God, please, would you please stop me? I want to come into your presence and humbly present myself, fall on my face, and say, God, if there's anything in my life that's unpleasing, Father, forgive me. Wash me, purify me. I want to be consecrated. I want to get things right with you. And I believe, church, if we will do that, if we will prepare ourselves and we participate in the work of praising God, we participate in the work of die, getting into that word and eating it and eating it, if we participate in all those things, I believe God's glory will come down and consume your life like never before. You'll leave this place jumping and leaping and praising God. And tomorrow somebody will say, what happened to you? Say, look at me. Look at me. Man, I've been anointed by the power of God. Everything looks different today. Wow, the glory of God changes everything. God, today, Lord, just let this power and presence go with us 24-7. Let our lamps be trimmed and burning bright today. God, don't let us let the oil run out. Don't let us let anything, but Lord, every day read your word. Every day live your word. God, burn in us today. Set us on fire. Set us on fire. God, I want Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, the Lord part of it's Acts 5. Consecrate us, I pray. The precious holy name. And everybody said, Amen. Now here's what we sure hope you were blessed by Pastor Bardwell's message. Join us anytime at PCAChurch.com and every Sunday at 2313 East Prospect in Ponca City.